help him after he spills his rice. Um, so Balzac doesn't really translate as Balzac in um, in Chinese. We find out in chapter seven it would be Ba E Zake. That's um, a four syllable translation of it. And uh, the book they get is Usul Mure. Um, and um, anyway, that's obviously um, quite uh, significant. The the father in that book, Usul Mure, uh, is an atheist who becomes Christian and um, it ends very happily, I must say, the daughter marries the dream husband that she wants. So um, anyway, um, the narrator feels a, a stab of jealousy as Lua visits uh, the little uh, seamstress and he writes uh, a passage from Usol Murue uh, on uh, his sheepskin coat. Um, then uh, later, Luo shows, uh, show, shows the narrator a handkerchief stained with blood, which shows how he's taken the little seamstress's virginity by a ginkgo tree. He says, we made love there on page 55, standing like horses. A uh, ginkgo tree is a very unusual kind of tree, almost uh, an extinct living fossil, you might say. Chapter 8, um, we find out they're not going to get any, any more books for favours, Luo and the narrator. Um, so they now regret having returned the Balzac book after reading it. And uh, the little seamstress puts on what I would describe as the Balzac coat to feel more intelligent. And uh, Four Eyes kills lice on his jacket and uh, by boiling it. And they find out that he's gone to Thousand Meter Cliff um, to try to translate some uh, songs some local songs and and uh, he's really looking for a job that his mother can uh, can fix up for him but he needs to come up with some songs so uh, Luo says that they can go to Thousand Meter Cliff find the miller who's got all these uh, songs and and get him to sing them because um, Four Eyes has been unsuccessful in managing to do that so chapter 9 we get the journey to Thousand Meter Cliff and um, now it's the summer of 73, so it's two years later. And we find out the little seamstress has made uniforms for the pair of them. And um, and uh, the the whole idea is that Luo is the translator and um, and uh, the, the main character, the narrator, he's pretending to be from Peking or Beijing. And in Beijing and Peking, they only speak Mandarin. So the miller cannot understand Mandarin, so that's why... Uh, that's why Luo is pretending he's a translator. So they find the miller by the water mill, naturally enough, and we find out Luo has a suave con man voice um, at page 64. What does that tell you about storytellers? Are they all con men of sorts? In, uh, we also find out the narrator's wearing a tight-fitting cap, which uh, I feel is very representative of the revolution, uh, the Chinese um, Communist Party, and he says, it felt more and more like a metal clamp on my skull. That's um, page 66, which seems to relate to uh, the lack of freedom. And uh, then they're asked to, to eat jade dumplings, which are in fact stones, um, but they go through the motions, which is something that Four Eyes didn't do, which is why the miller didn't like him very much. And then um, the miller makes them laugh with little waves, um, that appear upon his stomach as he sings those songs. And uh, the narrator accidentally speaks uh, Sichuan and blows his cover uh, because he was drinking lamp oil. He actually asked what kind of uh, moonshine is this, moonshine being that illegally brewed alcohol. Uh, luckily, they must have been so drunk that uh, nobody notices, but we don't re really get that loose end tied up. So then it's chapter 10. Uh, we find out they've managed to get 18 songs from the miller, uh, most of which are smutty rhymes, uh, as far as four, four Eyes is concerned. And uh, his voice now has the sharp edge of an army commander, page 71. And he said he wanted uplifting lyrics. Of course, he hasn't got that. With an undertone of romantic realism. And... Um, he says he's worried that the, the old miller would be accused of spreading erotic material. And um, Four Eyes is described as insanely arrogant at this stage. But Four Eyes is clever enough to rewrite the lyrics. And then they have a bit of a fight over those, uh, over those um, words they've actually written down on paper. But uh, we get to chapter 11 then. The setting now is Yongjing. Uh, basically, it's described as a 200 meter long um, road, pretty much. And um, 
the reason why they're sent there is the uh, ex-opium grower turned communist was besotted with the alarm clock, the rooster alarm clock, and the ex-opium grower, of course, turned communist, is in fact the, the head man of the village. So this time they were accompanied by the little seamstress. The town is no bigger than a pocket handkerchief. Of course, that's a reminder of what the little seamstress has done with um, with Lua, his best friend, the narrator's best friend. And they watch the film because it's so busy. They watch the film because they're sent there specifically to watch films and, and relate the stories. They watch the film behind the screen. So they watch everything in reverse. But as... Um, as the narrator points out, it's still just the same old bad film. And um, then he uh, then he um, buries some sweet potatoes in embers while Luo and uh, the little seamstress vis visit a grave of her of her grandfather. And then uh, he comes across a rich a rich woman knitting. She's being carried around. She's obviously very well off. He offers her one of her sweet potatoes. He's curious because he thinks it could possibly be Four Eyes' uh, mother, and he's correct. Um, well, you sense that he thinks that, but he, um, but anyway, he's that if he does assume that, he's correct in that assumption. He he actually tells her that he's Luo, and she tells him uh, Four Eyes is not very fond of your friend. So, a case of mis mistaken identity. There, it's quite amusing that scene on page eighty-one. And um, then he, he comes out and says uh, a bit later before the chapter ends that he actually does want to marry the, the little seamstress. And um, and then um, there's, they, they start talking. They start talking about uh, possibly uh, about possibly stealing Four Eyes' books because the little seamstress clearly wants, wants them for herself. Anyway, so then uh, we're on to chapter 12. There's the uh, planned slaughter of the buffalo, a celebration to end the... Uh, to mark the end of Four Eyes' re-education in the countryside, Luo and the narrator are not on the guest list, um, which seems a bit mean and uh, makes you think their their planned robbery is justified. Um, Four Eyes is collecting the blood of the buffalo in a hat woven of bamboo leaves. Once again, it seems to be a, a reminder of the uh, of what's happened between uh, the little seamstress and Luo. So he drinks this congealed blood, which is a remedy against cowardice. Um, we find out in the previous chapter that he's actually lied to his mother and said that he beat up the narrator when, in fact, it really was the other way around. But, of course, we're hearing it from the uh, from the narrator's point of view. So can we trust the narrator? You have to remember that. Is it an unreliable narrator, this particular narrator? I tended to get sucked into this story despite some of the self-conscious elements within it. So it was quite hard for me to, to wonder whether it was reliable or not. I just just went with that first-person version of things. But if I read it again, perhaps I'll have a completely different view. So um, once again, we see the five sorceresses. They turn up, all of them armed with a bow and arrow this time, for this celebration of, of Four Eyes' uh, end of re-education. And um, obviously they've paid a lot of money for this, uh, for this particular um, event. Uh, the suitcase, as they break into the uh, Four Eyes' uh, place, they find the suitcase is tied with a thick rope of plaited straw, a bit like the miller's belt um, in one of the previous scenes. Um, and uh, in the suitcase they find the likes of Charles Dickens, Kipling, Emily Bronte, uh, Victor Hugo, Stendhal, Dumas, Flaubert, Baudelaire, Romain Roland, Rousseau, Tolstoy, Gogol and Dostoevsky. So a lot of authors there to choose from. And they can't decide how many books they should take. And uh, Luo's greedy enough to want all of them. And um, so he is described here as like a Christian taking a solemn oath. So you have to wonder about the author's view of religion. Sounds like he's pro-Christian. Uh, anyway, then they, um, then they find that, um, that they're getting broken in on. Uh, even though they're the, the ones that are breaking in, they're actually, they've locked themselves in and then, then they hear the lock turning and next thing you know, uh, Four Eyes and his mother have, have come back to the to the place and uh, they have to hide under the bed um, and um, the narrator shares his space under the bed with a soil bucket and Four Eyes decides that he wants to put his buffalo tail, which is uh, from the killed buffalo from the celebration, into the suitcase um, but it doesn't seem that he he doesn't really notice anything particularly untoward, and uh, and so they of course escape with that suitcase and all the books inside. 
Uh, part three comes with uh, starts with chapter 13, and we see a red-beaked raven keeping watch on Luo carrying um, um, old old uh, Go. It's called Old Go. This particular Balzac book uh, in Chinese, but the real the real name of it is Pear uh, Goyo. He's carrying it to the little seamstress. Um, this particular book gave rise to a character called Rastignac, who is an immoral social climber, a little bit like Four Eyes. Uh, so you see the uh, intertextuality working very well there in the book. And um, anyway, he's um, uh, the, the two boys are seduced in September uh, of 1973 by this uh, all the books they're reading, and as they describe it, the Western literatures, women, love and sex. So that's on page 101, and the red beak raven occurs a lot, and really it's like uh, it's like the red guard watching watching over activities, and um, of course there's a lot of spying. Uh, there was a lot of spying uh, in communist China around that time, people reporting on each other and so on. So uh, then um, we find out that um, the narrator is only 18, despite around about two years passing since he was. Um, 17, so clearly he must be nearly 19. He says he fell in love with Flaubert, Gougal, Melville, who wasn't mentioned in, in earlier on when we went through the list of books in the suitcase, and uh, even uh, Roland, he says. But um, he's really uh, the translation of Jean Christophe is his favourite because of the fierce individualism within it, untainted by malice, he says, in the way he stands up against the whole world. Is very inspirational for for the narrator. So uh, he gifts this book to himself for his birthday. He asks his friend uh, Luo to sign it, and he gives three Balzac books to Luo. And um, and then uh, he draws. This is where we almost get a revelation about his name. He draws three figures um, representing the three Chinese characters constituting his name. The first was a galloping horse. The second, a long pointed sword, and the third was a bell sounding the alarm. So, make of that what you will. He was uh, tempted to add a drop of his blood, he says, and uh, and then um, he uh, he know he actually com um, compares his friend Lua uh, to a knight errant, which brings back uh, the memory of Don Quixote mentioned earlier, as Lua vanishes into the morning mist, which again I think represents communism towards the little seamstress's house. So, chapter 13 continued. Uh, continued. Luo is being very brave, in fact, because he's afraid of heights and he has to scale a mountain to get across to the little seamstress. Uh, the little seamstress is like his religion. And, um, and then the narrator says, I decided to accompany Luo on his pilgrimage. And he said, even I started trembling when I set foot on the ridge. A raven with a red beak was waiting, of course, for them to fall, so it seemed. And then... Um, then they get this dark silhouette of the raven. I thought it foreshadowed death. Again, uh, perhaps the author was teasing us again um, with the, that literary device because it doesn't indeed happen. Uh, Luo wiggles his bottom at the narrator like a monkey. And then the red-beaked raven took off. It's almost like Luo uh, flies in the face of, um, of, of everything that com the communists expect. And uh, he's, he kind of knows how to play the system, if you like. Uh, anyway, the narrator has a dream that uh, Luo was um, with the daughter of the janitor at the hospital, which is similar to one of the opening chapters when his dad, when his father is um, almost convicted of um, bedding a nurse. Uh, 